It is the 17th all day, I'm told, uh, of February 2021. We're getting together for another Topher spin. I'm calling it uh, the Knowledge Bolide Hangout because that's what my YouTube channel is called, Knowledge Bolide. So this is the Knowledge Bolide Hangout sponsored by. So um, got a really good hangout slash show plan tonight. Um, as we said, it's the 17th of February. Tomorrow is a very, very important day in the exploration of space. We are going to try something next or tomorrow that uh, we've never tried before. Does anyone know what that is? Mars landing. Well, we've landed on Mars before. Listen to the landing on at Mars. It's the, it's the way they're landing on Mars. Okay. We, yep. We've landed like this on Mars before. Um, uh, we, we are going to be able to listen to it. Who I think Bruce said we're going to be able to listen to it. So there's going to be a lot of cameras and a lot of microphones, and we're going to be able to watch it live, which is 14 or 17 minutes, I think 15 minutes after the fact or something like that. Yeah, actually uh, 13 or 14 seconds after the fact, yeah. Seconds? Um, so yeah, it, it, that, that's speed of light from, from Mars. Uh, so the thing will be down on the surface for uh, uh, seven. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, no, you're right. It's, it's not I, seconds, it, it's minutes. I'm sorry. It's uh, minutes. I okay. to edit that out. Uh, because yeah, it, it, I have a video yeah. later on that doesn't agree with you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, um, but but the, the, the cool thing about it is the thing's going to be on the surface either crashed in a big rumpled pile or perfectly landed or something in between for seven minutes before we find out about it. <laughs> yes. But, but the yes. one new thing that, that uh, this mission has that the other ones don't is now everybody and his brother has a drone and so does the rover. Exactly. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there's, there was a million right answers, but the one that my OCD was looking for was the first powered flight on another planetary body. So um, I think with that, uh, I have a bunch of show and tell for today. Look at this. I got a, got a box cool. from uh, my buddy Juan uh, mm. Avilas at uh, Jurassic Dreams Fossils. And he does a lot of meteorites as well. Um, I know a lot of the people on here are meteorite, uh, are fossil hunters and fossil collectors as well. So he is a uh, anthropologist, I believe, by trade. So that's what he knows before meteorites. So he sent me a little collector's kit of, and I haven't looked at it yet. I'm doing a box opening with you guys of a gift that he sent me of a bunch of Moroccan fossils. So wow. it's, it's supposed to be a nice display case and everything, and it's not broken. So <laughs> we'll get to cool. look at that a little bit later. So definitely have some show and tell. Let me pause this real quick, and we'll go into our uh, descent to Mars. Ah, so this is our little teaser page of what we have coming up today. Uh, our international guests are checking in, as always, Maxime and Marco. And we're going to discuss, obviously, Mars and on our tour, our weekly tour of the universe that we are not the universe, the weekly tour of our solar system that I introduced last week. Um, we are continuing that tour today with a stop on Jupiter. So we're going to get to that in a second. But there's something that I'm really, really proud to at least know of and, and get the news out there. A brand new mineral has been identified and named for Carlton Moore. It's Carlton Moorite. And I'm super, I mean, I had nothing to do with it, but so I can't be proud, but I'm super happy, super excited for this because 
Um, I personally know um, Carlton Moore and Dr. Lawrence Garvey. Um, and in fact, Carlton Moore calls me on the phone quite often. <clears throat> I'm expecting a little present from him in the mail. Um, so it was really interesting when I saw this press release from ASU. Uh, Carlton Moore is the founder of ASU's uh, Center for Meteorite Studies, and um, he has since passed the reins along. Um, but this new mineral was discovered in the Norton County Albright, uh, and it's just a very interesting uh, thing to have the to have a sample named after someone that you know. Um, this is a little bit more information about um, um, his reaction. He's, it's a, it, it's, um, he says he appreciates it being named after him, but all the credit goes to Lawrence Garvey. The interesting thing about this material, the, the, the mineral, is that the small grains are dominated by nickel and silicon, but importantly, they, they lack phosphorus. And as you can tell, I'm reading that word for word because that is all I know about it. <laughs> but... Um, Lawrence has a really, really cool take on science and how it affects him. And, and, and I tend to be on the same wavelength as him. And he mentions in the bottom here that every new mineral, no matter how tiny or rare, gives us, it helps us uncover the rich tapestry of nature. Each mineral is a snapshot into a very specific conditions under which it is formed. Uh, and uh, now when nature presents us with this new mineral, it's our job to be smart enough to figure out what it's telling us. I just think that is a beautiful, that's almost like a uh, Carl Sagan quote. I think that's beautiful. So here is a, a sample of what uh, um, the meteorite actually looks like on the right-hand side is, is my photo of a piece. On the left-hand side is a phosphorus piece uh, under black light taken by uh, Dr. Garvey. Um, very interesting fact about um, Carlton Moore is he was a member of the Lunar Sample Preliminary Examination Team for the Apollo program. When the moon samples came back, he is on the team, you know, the principal investigator uh, as well. It's just it's absolutely amazing. And he has a meet an asteroid named after him too. So, you know, what else, what can you get the guy that has everything? <laughs> Many more years of, of health to you, Carlton. But tomorrow we start our trip, our descent to Mars. We're going to Mars for the search for uh, ancient life. Here's a, a picture of the, uh, the rover folded up uh, on, the, on the top corner. Then on the bottom, you see it fully extended and ready for action with its numerous cameras and sensing equipment and uh, core drilling. And then as we hinted at, Ingenuity is the name of the helicopter, the, the, the helicopter with two propellers only because there's not that much uh, atmosphere there. Um, so we see them working on it as well. Um, so one of the really important things about spending all this money and getting all this, you know, all this mental <laughs> workload together is like, you got to find the right spot to land or you're going to be driving for two years to get to the right spot. So as you can see on this, uh, and we, we talked about this a little bit last week, but on this one picture here, you can see where um, we've been landing on Mars and it's all in a concentrated area. And if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, you can kind of, that gives you a hint of why we picked Zezero Crater as the place to land. <laughs> You know, Mars is the closest place that we can reach with robotic exploration that we think had a really good chance of having ancient life. The Perseverance rover will land at a location called Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is a very interesting place. It's a crater that once held a lake. 
There are a lot of craters on the surface of Mars that could have once hosted ancient lakes, but not every crater that we think had a lake actually preserves evidence that that lake was there. It had an inflow channel and it had an outflow channel. That means it was filled, the crater was filled with water. In Jezero, we have probably one of the most beautifully preserved delta deposits on Mars in that crater. This is a wonderful place to live for microorganisms, and it is also a wonderful place for those microorganisms to be preserved so that we can find them now so many billions of years later. There is no other place on Mars that has the unique combination of a lake setting, a beautifully preserved delta, and the diverse mineralogy that we have in Jezero Crater. So it's truly a special landing site. The major goal of the Perseverance mission is to investigate astrobiology on Mars, and in particular, to address the question of whether life ever existed on Mars. The Perseverance rover starts with a design that's very similar to Curiosity, but we've added to it a whole new set of science instruments. And these science instruments were purposefully selected to help us in the search for biosignatures. We're gonna be taking uh, microphones with us for the first time we're going to have uh, that human sense on another planet. Perseverance carries with her a grand experiment in space-faring technology, a helicopter, the name of which is now Ingenuity. One of the major upgrades that Perseverance has from Curiosity is that it's able to self-drive for a distance of up to 200 meters per day. As the rover is driving, it's literally building the map of the road it's driving on on Mars. Scientists for years have told us that to really unlock the secrets of Mars, we have to bring samples from Mars back to Earth. So what Mars 2020 is going to do is to drill samples, put them in small tubes. We're going to seal it in its own individual tube. We set them on the surface to provide a target for the second two missions which hopefully will get in development in the next several years and could potentially get the samples back to Earth by 2031. Perseverance is a very, very profound first step in both our understanding of our place in the universe and a stepping stone towards human exploration on Mars. So, that's why we're going to Jezero Crater. Let me pause this for one second. Cool, yeah. detail about the sample tubes. Oh yeah, we're, we're deep diving now. And yeah, we actually, you bet. We, we paused in order to fix the video to give everyone full screen. So hopefully that looks a little bit better for you guys. Um, what we're looking at here as as Pat brought out, these are the sample tubes. This is the first time, I'm not, I'm not going to over talk it, but on the bottom of, in bottom middle, you're actually looking at the underside of the rover. There's a robotic arm that moves in, in to, into place to secure uh, each of these, I think, 42 capsules that, that go in here. So we're going to learn more about that right now, I think, if... We are working on something that is the cleanest we've ever really attempted to send into space. The Perseverance mission has as its central goal astrobiology and also being the first step in Mars sample return. We're going to collect a suite of samples, about 35 samples that each weigh about 15 grams. I mean, the reason we, we collect those intact samples is that we are the first mission that's part of Mars Sample Return, and it's our job to collect the, the samples intact uh, to be brought back to Earth uh, for further analysis. To better assess the question of, was there life previously on Mars? Inside the belly of the rover sit a number of sample tubes and an entire adaptive caching assembly that is used to help collect these samples. Extraordinarily complex robotic system. And to make it even more complicated, it has to be super clean. We don't want to have these samples come back from Mars and discover life in them, but then realize, oh, that's life that was in the apparatus when we sent it to Mars. 
That was a, a, a big challenge for the mission um, because we were meeting cleanliness standards that no, no rover mission has ever had to meet before. The requirements that we have for this mission are extraordinarily challenging. Once we would go through machining the tube itself, getting all of our protective coatings on there, and then looking at our beautiful tubes, we found carbon contamination in places we were not expecting. So as a team, we all had to really come together and look at the entire manufacturing process, how we're handling these tubes. We had to start polishing the interior bore prior to putting on some of our protective coatings. It meant having to come up with an entirely new technique to clean all of the hardware uh, and demonstrate that the hardware m could maintain that cleanliness all the way to Mars. That's what JPL does. I mean, we discover problems and then we solve them. Having these very strict controls and this record of how much contamination or how clean these tubes are prior to going to Mars is essential for that return sample science. Great discoveries require remarkable evidence. And so the cleanliness of the sample tubes and of all of the hardware that's going to be collecting those samples uh, is paramount in making sure that the evidence and that the story and that the discoveries that come from these, these samples that are brought back are irrefutably Martian. Hell yeah. <laughs> so that that's... is so cool. <laughs> and I was watching other videos and they, they don't like it, but they all use the term that the rover is going to poop out the samples. <laughs> 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 because in all honesty, after the samples are are collected, uh, after the tubes are full, wherever they're gathered, they're going to be pooped out. They're just going to be dropped there. And, you know, uh, GPS or whatever coordinates uh, are going to be used in order to, on future missions, come on and, and pooper scooper them. And, and they're actually nicknaming it the pooper scooper missions. <laughs> but this all started years ago, obviously, with the planning and getting it all approved and, and moving through all the steps, A, th or all the approval levels, A through F of, of the, of the, uh, the um, program. Well, tomorrow, I think we enter D stage. D stage, that is the seven minutes of terror. I just, I want to stare at this just for a while because it's, I built it myself. I just had a freeze frames, but how beautiful is that? You have a, a streaking, ablating heat shield coming through the Martian atmosphere, delivering the payload built by humans. And now we get to find out exactly how it's deployed onto the surface. down to 200 miles an hour now.
Just let that sink in. Yeah, the complexity of the landing scheme is uh, is high, but we've already demonstrated once that we can do this. So mm -hmm. that's an amazing video. It's I. Yeah, there was there was a short version of the video that was only like forty seconds long, and then there was the full version, and I was like, ah, uh, no, nah, we're we're doing the full one. <laughs> I was uh, I was listening to an interview uh, a few weeks ago, and they actually talked about that one of the most complex pieces of the entire uh, probe thing was actually developing uh, the supersonic parachute. That taking it from thirteen thousand to two hundred miles an hour. That they said that that alone was like three years worth of testing, trying just trying to find something because it didn't exist. Oh wow, that's yeah, crazy. And and, and the atmosphere on Mars is roughly 1% of the density of our atmosphere on Earth. The, uh, the rover that's, or the uh, uh, drone that's on this mission, uh, the close-up of it there showed the, how wide the blades are. And uh, it, it has to work really hard to get much of a purchase on 1% of the density that we have. Yeah. I, I just, those animations that they created um, JPL and NASA, those are, I mean, obviously I didn't make those. <laughs> that is just, they blow my mind. And tomorrow we're actually going to be able to witness parts of that. I mean, it's not going to be, there's not going to be GoPros flying all over Mars filming it for us <laughs> from the preferred angle with perfect lighting. But um, do we know what time it's supposed to be? Um, I think it starts around nine o'clock Arizona time. No, a, I don't know. It's it's tomorrow mid morning. Okay. Yeah, because everything's in East Coast. Mid morning. Yeah, I, I think I think the landing is actually about eleven, uh, roughly eleven a.m. Pacific time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If if you have internet access tomorrow and uh, you can't find it, then you probably need to get your eyes checked because <laughs> it's going to be everywhere. I hope. Um, yeah, let me. I think we have one more video on uh, on the actual um, uh, in in integ not integrity. I can't think of the name of the of the drone now. Ingenuity. <laughs> so hold on one sec. We'll get that video up. All right. So here is the actual Ingenuity uh, helicopter drone. You can call it a helicopter with, with two. Yeah. So uh, let me see how you get to the next slide here. There we go. See, he pooped out the drone. pretty cool the first time we're gonna have powered flight on another planet man um yeah so we were discussing a little bit of uh you know why or you know the, the complexity of the descent and and putting the hardware down on the on the planet's surface and um do you remember I, not, not we did this we did this same thing with the pathfinder but there was another one that we wrapped in like beach balls and just let it mm -hmm. bounce and roll around curiosity? yeah arthur you can turn up your mic but i think that was curiosity um that did yeah, that was, one it, it was when we landed the twin drones that they used the airbag um uh technique 
um, uh, I think Curiosity is the last one and the, the one before this, and it used the Sky Crane uh, mm. scheme. Yeah. Uh, and I, I fact checked really quickly. The coverage on NASA TV starts at 2.15 p.m. Eastern time, which is 11.15 a.m. Um, uh, Pacific time. And the landing will be roughly one hour and 40 minutes after the start of coverage. So it's at 3.55 p.m. Eastern, uh, 12.55 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And there's, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I may actually, depending on my workload tomorrow, uh, I may uh, try to do a, a, a watch party on Facebook. That'll be cool. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we can get a bunch in the, in the room together and, and do that. So yeah, stay, stay tuned tomorrow. Uh, or if you're watching this tonight, cause I don't sleep until I get these on, on YouTube. If you're a diehard and you watch it in, at night and you can stay awake till the morning, <laughs> by all means, join us and we'll see if it makes it there or not. Um, let me see here. I have a bunch of, uh, any, let anyone want to discuss uh, Mars a little bit more? I, I think uh, two things that I wanted to, that I wanted to mention. Um, number one is the, the reason for the sky crane uh, device is to ensure that when the rover gets put on the surface, it's not been beat up with dust and contaminated. It's as clean as possible. And that's another reason why you saw, and, and it's not gonna happen all the same day in all the same way, but they kind of demonstrated that the drone can fall out from underneath, can be deposited on, on the surface from underneath the drone, underneath the rover, have the rover go away. Once the rover is at a safe distance where it's not going to be pummeled by debris, kick up, and it can maintain camera um, focus, there should be a successful flight and film flight, but it will be away from the, the rover for contamination and just sandblasting reasons. Um, and the other thing that I thought was really cool about the whole experience is they're building these canisters to collect 35 samples, each 15, up to 15 grams, the core drilling. And the return of those, they, they say 2033 or 2031 or something like that. Yeah, I think 2031 is the most optimistic. Uh, we, we don't have that mission all worked out yet, and we certainly don't have it funded yet. Mm -hmm. In the last few years, though, we've, I've noticed, not even the last few, well, yeah, the last few years, I've noticed a difference between, like, now we're going to, you know, we're going to asteroids. We're going to high to, to Bennu. We're going out to Vesta. We're going and retrieving samples from from the moon and bringing them back intact. We're going to Mars and bringing samples back intact, and and it, it I think that's absolutely amazing and fantastic. And the long term objective of it, the long term planning and, and the project management of it too, I applaud that as well. Um, you know, to, to think 10 years into the future, many, many people don't do that. <laughs> so, uh, I do have some, some show and tell that I can show off. Uh, if anyone like Cameron, Cameron, I know you had something you wanted to show. I didn't know if you were ready for that or not, but, uh, I, I have a piece of diagenite that I just got and it's pretty sizable. Wow, and hard to open. There we go. Uh, let me switch to this camera. There we go. So this is my uh, piece of diagenite. It is NWA12931. The main mass holder is Dustin Dickens, and this is just over 215 grams. Wow. Yeah, it's it's so big it it ripped my uh, my case. <laughs> But beautiful crust. So diagenite is an achondrite. It's not a it's not a stony mm -hmm. meteorite. And 
comes from asteroids that are typical like uh, Vesta. So this is, it's hard to believe that this is not the pretty side. This is the pretty side with crust, but then you get into it. And it's just a beautiful color, beautiful crystals in it. And my phone won't zoom in. That's awesome. Yeah, this is just, and there's a little speck of metal in there too. I don't know if you guys can see that right about there, right there. Yeah, so that that is just a, a beautiful bunch of space crystals in there and a pretty sizable hunk. I, I love when there's yeah. a <laughs> big inclusion or big crystal that goes around the edges. Yeah, that's a that's a substantial meteorite. <laughs> I am the temporary custodian of it only. Yeah. So whoever, yeah, that, that means it's a it's available in my inventory, but I just couldn't turn this, couldn't turn it away, because I know how beautiful this stuff is. I mean, you can take some slices off and still have a nice piece. But what what's interesting is the the metal bleb right there because there's some theories that's excuse me that say that that could be from the impactor yeah that's the prevailing theory on the the metal blebs in lunar uh, meteorites is that uh, it was part of the impactor Bo, if you have something that you want to say, just jump right in. If you have something to show, I'll come to you in a second so I see your hand up. But anyone, feel free to interrupt or interject whenever possible. Wow, yeah. I just got this a few days ago and figured I'd show it to you guys. Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> um, Let's let's actually check in on uh, on Bo. So hold on a second. Uh, Bo, do you have something for us? There we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I've got a little thing I wanted to show. Um, it's not huge. It is a whopping uh, see point six four grams, but. Uh, uh, Axtel, uh, carbonaceous chondrite, uh, one of the only ones that's found in Texas. Uh, and so I'm a, I'm a really big uh, fan of the carbonaceous chondrites. And so mm. one that was found here in Texas, uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm just really, really happy it landed in my somewhat backyard. <laughs> that checks all your boxes, huh? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I think last week, Mike Kelly showed us, uh, uh, Xtel as well. Oh, he did. Yeah, nice I did big not CAI on the top of that piece too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now that I put the the lid back on, it won't focus. There you. Go. Yeah, there he goes. Yeah, it's a massive little, massive little, massive um, CAI <laughs> on there. Yeah. Looks like it's flipping us off though. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks, man. No, yeah. you know what? Um, size doesn't size doesn't matter um, necessarily in meteorites when they have great features. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, we always have a weekly check in, and we're gonna check in with them later um, tonight. Uh, Marco and Maxime, our overseas buddies, and Marco didn't make a video about oriented meteorites finally so now i get to show three of my oriented meteorites <laughs> they just arrived today and i really want to show them off but it's kind of like man after seeing marco's stuff like ugh. so he went a different way with his video this week so i'm safe to show my little 13 grand piece and feel proud of it <laughs> hey, pat what you got going on man yeah, so I've got uh, I've got some show and tell items here. So this is the this is the big uh, chondrite. Um, 
that Topper just uh, brokered for me. Um, eight three 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 point two grams is the is the final weight on it, and uh, I'm I figured out that my twelve inch saw after I expand the chuck and put the new blade on will cut this just sort of barely. Really, uh, but you can, can see how concave that broken surface is, but uh, with the uh, with the 12 inch saw blade, there's uh, there's gonna be enough room to get in there to make a cut. 12 inches is a massive blade. Yeah, it's uh, I, I think you missed a decimal spot in your weight. That's not 850 grams. That's- no, it's, Yeah, it's uh, 8333.2. I may have left a three out there. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's not an 800 gram rock. That's 8.3 no. <laughs> kilos of love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so here's the mm. here's the saw blade. Good. Just, just arrived moments ago <laughs> off of the uh, the Amazon truck. Man. And then um, uh, so you get about six inches of depth cut with that saw with that blade. Yeah, we can barely hear you. I but I think the question was um, with with a twelve inch blade like that, do you get six inches of cut? With a six inch blade, do you get three inches of cut? Yeah, you don't you don't quite get the full cut. Um, uh, the the size of the hub and the size of the um, uh, two two flanges that go on the on the saw blade uh, to uh, the two flanges that go on the saw blade to to stiffen the saw blade uh, to consume some of that depth. So. Uh, by modifying the vise, uh, I'm going to get almost five inches of mm -hmm. cut on uh, on that one. And then I have a couple more, and this is going to be a bit experimental, but we'll get, have a go. Uh, Marco talked about uh, he showed one particularly nice oriented meteorite with very blocky uh, uh, shape to it. And this is another uh, oriented meteorite that has a very blocky shape. And this, this blocky shape is generally believed to be a function of, uh, of the, the asteroid uh, cracking along uh, lines of weakness. But you can oh, see really? there... Uh, you can see the uh, the flow lines. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and and it's the the detail in them as they come around the uh, the notch in the bottom is really interesting. Wow. And so the bottom is actually the face of it. That's the face, yes. And it doesn't. It's a little bit sandblasted wow. on that surface, and it doesn't really show uh, flow lines. But each uh, each of the sides, well, that's that's showing reasonably well there. Each of the sides uh, show the uh, wow. the flow lines coming up. And yeah, then, you can. Jeez. Yeah, and then it uh, in flight it fractured uh, on top. So there's. Uh, you don't get to see the surface all the way up, but there's secondary fusion crust mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just a bit of a rollover lip uh, visible there too. Wow. That is a weird shape. That's the weird orientation for an oriented meteorite. Yeah. Yeah. It is a, a, an unusual shape. This one is another very unusual shape. Um, the... Um, This one, the, the, the front side, unfortunately, is, is fractured. Mm. Uh, that's the back side. Jeez. And it's common for the back side to have of, a, of an oriented meteorite that's, that's stayed in orientation for a long time to have very shallow regmaglyphs mm. visible. And that the flow lines on this one are really, really fine. And I'm not sure. 
sure I'm going to be able to capture them. Yeah, there you can see yeah. some of them. And there's what, a is that a massive megachondral? It's a it's a dark inclusion that I think is carbonaceous uh, material. Jeez, a moly! Yeah, and uh, for scale, that uh, that dark inclusion is a little more than an inch long. Wow! And it shows very, very, very fine uh, flow lines across that surface. The flow lines across that surface are, are different than the than the rocky surface. They are, yes. They're 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 definitely finer, which you know demonstrates very well that uh that they are that it's a, a different material yeah and then on on this side uh that's this is a, a back backwards facing uh part of the back side of the meteorite mm -hmm. and then they're very hard to see but there are some very very fine flow lines over the, the toe of the thing. Mm -hmm. And then a... Uh, that side is sexy right there. <laughs> a, nice, a nice rollover lip mm -hmm. and, uh, and some frothy fusion crests around the, uh, around the back side. Frothy bubbly. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's nice. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on on that one. There is a lot going on, and I, it's, uh, it's amazing that it, that it made it here. But uh, boy, it sure would have been nice to, uh, to seam the whole stone and uh, not have the, the tip broken off. Yeah. But uh, this was in a lot of meteorites that I purchased um, in 2008. So this was a. 14 and a half cents a gram uh, well, the purchase at that time. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> okay, yeah. Topher, back to you. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. I appreciate you showing those off, man. That's good, some good stuff. Um, let's see here. Uh, I think we should check in because uh, those are some nice oriented meteorites. Uh, you know what? Let me, let me show you a few of my little oriented meteorites, then we'll check in uh, overseas. So I have, I think, three of them. Uh, there we go. One, two, and three. Okay. So we're going to start off with the smallest one first. This, like I said, is only like a 13-gram puppy. But... It's really nice because it comes from my friend uh, Juan at uh, Jurassic Dreams Fossils. Um, so I love his COAs, just really, really nice. Um, but this is the, um, this is, oh, this one is 5.8 grams. I hope my phone zooms in. Nope, it's not going to zoom in. What a perfect little with full rollover lip. Well, that's beautiful. Is that an unclassified or? Yep, yep totally unclassified. Yeah, you know, uh, when I when I first went to Tucson in two thousand eight. Um, the the appreciation for the uh, for the oriented meteorites was not as great. And now they command a oh, yeah. significant price increase. But back then, you could find them in all the piles on the tables. No, not now. You're talking like two dollars a gram easily. Yeah. For, you know, <laughs> you, when you were talking fourteen cents a gram earlier, you know now now we're talking twenty twenty one prices. And my phone will not zoom in. I don't know why it does that some days. But that, that's a beautiful sample. Um, then another will go, you know what? I think, oh, yeah. This one is really cool. But the next one is oriented and has a special feature on it. So this one here is uh, 19 grams. 
end is really nice. Total heat shield. Yeah, classic you, shield shape. And you can see the flow lines coming around it. Nice. Dripping into the back. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So there's, we have a really hard, nice, uh, not, not hard, but a, a very bubbly uh, rollover lip. And we have what we what we were talking about. Uh, unfortunately, not a complete piece, but that right there was the selling point for me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you could really just see that, like right there, is that the angle it's coming at you. Yeah. So this is not nearly a uh, com as complete of a shield as. Uh, Marco has, but I'm not competing with him this week. <laughs> no, and you know what? Honestly, these things are never about showing off or one-upping each other. We're just proud and want to show off to other people who will understand, appreciate, and actually listen to us. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my third and final oriented one, and it I had to get it right away because it has a unique thing, 41 grams. Um, so we'll just, I'll just show it to you guys and you tell me what you, what you notice about it that's unusual. Why did I have to own this meteorite? Do, 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 do. Well, a really nice rollover lap, but there's a couple of interesting inclusions in there, too. Oh, that's that's why I bought it right there. Oh, uh, yeah. So we have a, yeah, we have an oriented meteorite coming at you like this. So this is the reverse side. We have rollover lipping. And a, and a kind of a hard edge going all the way around. So it's definitely, definitely an oriented meteorite. But on the back side, it has this impact. Something actually impacted this while it was liquid enough mm -hmm. to leave a full 360 crater. Mm -hmm. I just that, thought that was the coolest thing ever. That is really they awesome. Just have to find the matching piece. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've seen I've seen this before on Sakota lens, where you have on, and irons. Mm -hmm. I don't recall the last full impact crater I've seen on on a chondrite, and then you top it off as being a fully oriented one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was like, do I buy it? Do I buy it? Do I buy it? Do I buy it? I think I want it. I think I want it. Put it in my pile. <laughs> yeah, I have it. Yeah. So that's a, a unique. I mean, I, I've touched a lot of meteorites. And that's unique. Yeah. That stands out to me. It would be really interesting too, Toper, to uh, look at that one under the reflected cross-polarized light. One of the one of the benefits of of that lighting scheme is that uh, for uh, desert varnish, you can see through the desert varnish and see the rock underneath. For the parts that are true fusion crust, uh, on an ordinary chondrite, you can't see through the fusion crust. I wouldn't be at all surprised, but what there's some secondary fusion crust in that uh, impact and in, in the pit itself. I, yeah, and I I think a lot of those features, like we commonly see on Sakotaline, uh, they happen I think during the breakup of the meteorite in the top of the atmosphere. So it'd be fascinating to see if there is secondary fusion crust in the uh, in the impact pit there. It does look like like 
something came here and stopped it from from going any further. Right. Are there fine short veins running through it? You know, I wow, look at that. You can almost see like the very center where there's an impact. Mm -hmm. I actually just got this um before the hangout today. So yeah, I was very excited to to see it, but yeah, I'm gonna look at it a lot closer. Under the microscope. Yeah, yeah, under the microscope we go, man. But <laughs> uh yeah, so even even a small meteorite, you know, can tell a can tell a, a good story. Um, like that one obviously had some really really cool stuff happen to it while it was coming down to us. Mm -hmm. um, oh, good! I see Cameron is ready. I can I can shoot over to you if you want me. Yeah, I just had a couple of things. Um, I nice. uh, got a piece of my birthday. I say my birthday fall. It is actually also Michael Kelly's birthday fall as well. This is a gram and a half of K toll. It is a it's an end cut. You know how I like my end cuts. Mm-hmm. K toll. K A T O L. Yes. Got toll in India. Um the next one I have to show off. Uh, it's Cameron, sorry. How many birthday falls do you have? Um, how many happened on your birthday, and then how many do you have? Oh, do you I know? don't know how many happened on my birthday, but I think well, Michael Kelly. How many are we up to? Three, four, something like that. It's uh, it's five, and four are available. I believe. Mm. Okay. Yeah, but we got Slavetic, and there was another one, wasn't there? Slavetic, Kernov. Uh, Stannern, Ketal, and the fifth one is a Russian one, and it's I think it's like five or ten grams or something like that in in five small stones. Keep so it's it's it. not coming out of the uh, yeah, it's not coming out of the museum. Got gotcha. <laughs> right. Thank you. So I got this one because it has a little bitty rollover lip to it. Mm -hmm. Oh see yeah, it. beautiful. <laughs> I uh, <clears throat> I got it from a certain Steve Arnold for the low, low price of $8 shipping. Nice. That, that is so, amazing. Yeah, I, I, it's a 869. It's like yeah, and, five grams, something like that. Can we but, see the, can I see the front of it for a second? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's... It's it's rough, but it's beautiful only. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> from, I, from I, I feel like it's, yeah, I'm, 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 I feel like that lip is worth. Oh eight yeah. bucks, I Oh, absolutely. It. It's a yeah. beautiful little meteorite, and and NW eight sixty nine is you know there's lots of it around, but it is an amazing meteorite. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, oriented pieces, uh, and uh, because of the multiple lithologies inside, there's there's lots of interesting stuff going on inside as well. Yeah, I have a few slices, but I think this might be my first individual of 869. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's super nice, man. The real reason I'm here. Anybody want to guess? Wow. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Michael Kelly, of course, already knows what it is. Don't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I. Can I see the back side of it as well? Oh, super, hold on a second. Uh, hold on a second. Shine it into the light again. It's super friable, so I have not Okay, I, 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 know what, I know what it is. I can show it to you. I, I know what it is unless someone so wants, can, wants to take a guess. I can flip it over that way. Thanks to the magic of the... Yeah. Membrane case. I'm thinking that you're holding a Pakistani sample called Zob. Uh, no. Oh, swing and a miss. <laughs> swing and a uh, miss. Super fresh. I don't know uh, that I can open this again one handed. Oh, 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 I got it. Hang on. I thought I had it. Nope. 
Um, oh, oh, oh! <laughs> it's the other. It's the other one. It's Gatutu. Yes. Thank you. I. Nice job, Tober. Yeah, thank you. I, it is a uh, a super thick slice. I think it was sliced thick on purpose to show off all that crust. That yeah. Preserved because it's such a thick angle. You know, like a yeah. steep angle on the crust there. Yeah. So, beauty. I, I it's the metal that. that gave it away. That that so, big hunk of metal near the crust and also near that little inclusion at the bottom. That's gorgeous, man. So this is uh, ten point nine three grams. And, uh, of course, this would be my monthly plug. Oh, there we go. For the Meteorite of the Month. So, yeah. for, for those of you keeping score at home, that is now all of the major obtainable falls from 2020. Wow. Yeah, I, I, was, I, wa I wanted to say, you, you, you said Zobe. I was like, no, that was, that was last month. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, I have my Zobe and my uh, Gatutu right next to each other on the shelf, and I always confuse them. <laughs> wow. The Meteor of the Month Club uh, is, is put on, and I, I, have, I don't have a pony. In, do you want me to keep you highlight? Yeah. Yeah, no, um, you can go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the uh, the meteor of the month club. I don't have uh, a dog in the fight. I have I have no monetary value. You know, uh, I, I don't profit off it whatsoever. I'm, I'm not even a member of it because I have enough meteorites around me. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, if I, if I was a collector and not a dealer, I mean, I'm taking money out of my pocket here. Hopefully, you guys uh, buy stuff for me all the time, and it doesn't matter. But the $50 or $100 a month package offered for the Meteor of the Month Club through Mark Lyon um, is an absolute phenomenal, great way to go. Um, the samples that you are able to get, we did it, we did a, a, in the, if you look at the videos below, you'll see a 2020 wrap up. And Cameron took us through all 12 months and it's, it's mind numbing and it, it kind of hurts me as a dealer, but I'll tell you what, as a friend, I recommend it a hundred percent, you know, because he, he gets some samples to you guys and it's not just, you know, you're not just talking subgram stuff. You're talking about brand new, fresh falls, um, all of them for 2020. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. So uh, let me just hit pause for one second. Hey, Pat, you got some information on drilling on Mars for us? Yeah, we mentioned, I don't know if it was last week or week before last, we, we talked about uh, the drilling on, uh, you mentioned it, Tober, we talked about the drilling on, of uh, Curiosity versus um, the newest rover. And uh, the Curiosity drilling was about uh, drilling into a rock just a little ways to generate a pile of powder that they did XRF on. And it, it's... We, we use that uh, terrestrially as well. Uh, you, you pulverize a sample and do XRF. And so you're really getting to see not just the surface, but everything that's in the sample. Mm -hmm. uh, but the drilling here is really about generating those uh, core drill uh, samples. And boy, I, I would love to see those come back to earth. <laughs> yeah. That and would be amazing. You see in the picture on the at seven o'clock, you see them being pooped out. <laughs> So there is a little pooper scooper uh, that we need to come back and get. If you're a planetary scientist, though, that's got to break your heart that oh, all those samples are just sitting there on the yeah. surface in pristine little containers waiting to come back, waiting, waiting and waiting. Come back um, here, yeah. One of the one of the cool and and you know, stay tuned for our weekly updates. You know, I we're calling it groundbreaking because they're drilling, um, but stay tuned weekly because we're in, we're going to be highlighting different things about the mission and staying in touch with it. And just like I'm going to talk about the Moxie because that's if you if you talk to most of the scientists, well, <laughs> the the scientists who didn't work on a specific thing. <laughs> on the they're always going to like their part best but if you ask most scientists in general who didn't have a hand in this they're going to tell you that the moxie is where is where their excitement level is at so stay tuned for that information uh and with that we're actually going to check in with our uh our european branch of the hangout crew so we just had an anniversary of chelyabinks this past week so Maxime decided to 
overdose us on shell you banks and look at the dripping fusion crust on that top one Whoa. and every once in a while we look at a meteorite i i can't pause the video while he's going because it starts over so i'm going to say what i want to say now at seven o'clock do you see that shell you banks that looks iridescent yeah. that is not a camera trick oh my god it's beautiful <laughs> like unbelievable i've it's yeah sometimes we 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 is my eyes playing tricks on me is it really yeah, no this one is amazing so let's see what maxime has for us hi everyone maxime here i hope you're all doing good so at the time of this hangout two days ago it was the anniversary of the shelly abins committee right so it fell eight years ago and for that, I wanted to show you the the Shelly family I have here in my collection. And so we will focus on some specimens and look at them under the microscope and try to find some features common for Shelly So let's have a look at that right now. So here is my Shelyabins collection. As you can see, I mainly have gram-sized individuals, but I also have a thin section, some fragments, and a tiny slice. So what I love the most with meteorites is the fact that each of them is unique and has its own story to tell, and that is particularly true for Shelyabinsk. Because each Shelly is unique and shows features that tells a lot about what happened during its fall. And that is why I love Shelyabinsk. So let's start with some oriented or flight marked chilies. They are not as incredible as what Marco could show us, but anyway, I love them. The first specimen has this very nice aerodynamical shape, as you can see. It also shows some small radial markings and a little elongated regma glypt. You can also see that beautiful glossy greenish fusion crust. It's beautiful. That is a beauty and a very cool way of standing the it up. The best part of the specimen magnet. is that bubbly vesicular mm -hmm. fusion crust on the backside, which looks great under the microscope. Actually, it is very scratchy when you touch it, and you can see that it is full of little bubbles. And I find it to be a great example of the trailing side fusion crust or the backside fusion crust. Yeah, that's beautiful. Look at the colors in the fusion crust, too. <laughs> That's gorgeous. Now let's move to the second specimen, which looks like a mussel, which is great for a Belgian collector <laughs> like me. I really like the shape and features of this one. Its aerodynamical shape is very nice and it looks like a heat shield. There are also some barely visible radial flow lines on it and it has a nice frothy fusion crust on the back. No roll of lip for this one though. He's getting beautiful video from that microscope. Yeah, I know. Wow. Next is this very strange specimen, having this aerodynamical shape and showing some spikes on its edges. Those spikes were probably formed as some material melted and started to form some droplets. These were rapidly pushed to the edges by the airflow and eventually stayed attached to the specimen instead of just leaving it, forming that droplet spike formation. And I find it absolutely beautiful. Look at that. You're not alone. Yeah, that is that is really cool. That that's stuff in motion right Next at the end. Is of the one I call the micro nose gun. Its shape is absolutely beautiful and it seems to show some small regma glyphs too, making it look like a nice okay. little nose cone. It is very nice. Man. 
I kept the best for the end, as the last specimen I wanted to show you is this incredible iridescent individual. Look at this that. specimen shows gorgeous pink and green reflection, sometimes a little bluish. What surprised me the most is the intensity of those reflections, and that almost each millimeter squared of area is iridescent. That is absolutely wonderful. Look at that. That is crazy, amazing. Dude. That is stunning. And each side of it is iridescent. That is very nice. Seeing this, I just have one thing to say to you, is that if you have a lot of even tiny Shelyabinsk, just spend some time to inspect them individually, because there are a lot of things you can learn from them, and maybe you could find something unexpected. That is why I love Shelyabinsk, actually. Crazy colors. Then, last, I wanted to show you that little cicotalin specimen I received some weeks ago. And you can see that it is absolutely beautiful. It shows a very nice orientation. It has a wonderful whirl over lip, and the backside is like. It has like a frothy texture and the front side is, has an aerodynamical shape. No flow lines for this one, but anyway, it stays a very nice specimen and I really, really love it. Complete hard lip on it. Okay, that's it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. And I have to say that Shelyabinsk is one of my favorite meteorites uh, because there are thousands of pieces out there and each one is very unique and that is great because you can go through lots of uh, of mini Shelyabinsk meteorites and discover a lot of things so yes i really like this meteorite and yeah so that's it for today and see you next time that's awesome thank you maxime yeah it's it's true each each Shelyabinsk is different and you know what's uh <clears throat> you know, I Hi, oops, I have a uh, I have a high quality of standard for for my for what I'm doing here, and Marco and Maxime send me these videos, and I used to stress over the content. These guys are pros. They have great material, great narrative, great knowledge. So I've gotten to the point now, quite honestly where I literally just click through their video to make sure technically it's sound, to make sure when we're here that I have a video that will work for you. So I'm seeing these videos for the first time with you guys. Uh, I don't know if you, if I explained that to you or mentioned it before, but for the last like three weeks, I've just been clicking through just to make sure all the content's there, it's not corrupted, the audio works. The audio is synced because that could be a problem too. Um, but I'm watching these for the first time with you. I have not seen this video of Marco freezing his butt off to get us this beautiful space image. And we had a few requests for uh, the gentlemen to highlight some of their equipment. So for all the uh, astrophiles, or is that what they're called? Photograph. Uh, astrophiles um this is your kind of video hello everyone today it will be the first night since three months where we have a clear sky so i want to take you with me to a nice imaging night have fun yeah it is absolutely freezing cold right now we have minus four degrees centigrade but it will go down until till I think eight or nine degrees um, what it makes worse is that we have also a strong wind today so uh, yeah the temperature is really freezing freezing cold but nevertheless as you can see the sky is very clear right here in the back behind the trees you can see the Alps the Alp mountains and that's 
the gear for today and for tonight. It's an uh, Esprit 100 epichromatic refractor on a German equatorial mount, the EQ6R Pro. And today we will image a nice object, a reflection nebula M78 in the constellation Orion. So we will see and hopefully everything will work. Yeah, it's getting darker and darker. And the first thing that we have to do is to polar align the mount because only if a mount is polar aligned we can track the stars accurately and for that we have here a nice polar scope and this direction of the mount has to be into pointed to the celestial north pole which is very close to the star Polaris. So that's the first thing that we have to do. Yeah, after the polar alignment, we have to align the mount. So for that, we um, point the mount to two alignment stars um, on different directions uh, on the sky. And after that, the mount knows where it is and then we have the so-called go-to function. So the coordinates of the objects are into the computer database and then we only have to press one button and the mounts loose to the um, object that we want to observe. After that, of course, we have to focus. And after focusing, very, very important if you want to make images, is this little scope here because that's the guiding scope so here on the back side of the scope we have a little camera and this scope makes only one thing keeping a star near the object that we want to image um, keep that star in center and during this um, the mount makes very very weak um, corrections and keeps the star in the center of the view and then we can make long exposures with the camera which is here that red thing here that is a uh, dedic dedicate dedicated astronomy camera which can be cooled um, and for that we have very very low noise um, in the pictures which makes very very great and nice astro images so when the first stars are visible these are the first point that we have to do yeah one thing that's also special we are now a little bit after new moon and normally at new moon we don't have clear sky because the brighter the moon the worse uh, the conditions are to capture nice uh, astro images but today it seems to be yeah absolutely perfect conditions yeah and here you can see the scope in its tracking position pointing in direction orion okay guys so the image session is running now we're having now a look on the desktop of uh, my notebook and uh, that's the imaging software astrophotography tool and as you can see here is the object this is m78 and that greenish color is completely normal um, later on we can fix that in the um, processing of the picture yeah that's the guiding software so the guiding software controls a star and uh, centers it always in the middle of that uh, of that cross of that green cross that you can see and by this it is possible to make very very long exposures actually i'm doing five minute exposures so five minute exposures for one shot and a lot of those shots then will be stacked and then we get that nice 
image. After four and a half hours of imaging here in the cold, cold German oh, <laughs> weather, um, I finished the capturing of the so-called light frames. And um, what now is very important is that we have so-called correction frames. Uh, these are frames which, for example, reduces the um, um, vignetting um, that reduces uh, also noise out of those uh, pictures. And that's what I'm doing here. Now I'm cap capturing the so-called flight light, sorry, flat frames. And for that, we have these flat frame panel. And by doing such flat frames, we can uh, subtract from the lights, um, for example, uh, dust or, for example, a vignetting of the telescope. So that's the last thing that we have to do. And after that, we slew the telescope in its home position and well, then everything is finished. I have to put the telescope back inside into the warm, warm house. And then, yeah, we will see tomorrow what uh, nice picture we can generate with that captured images. Yeah, now all correction frames are captured. And now we can park the scope, slew it to the park position, and then oh, I have to go inside the house. <laughs> okay. Well, that's pretty badass. And as you can see, now the telescope slews to its park position. Yeah, that's it. Hand controller says turn off the power. Finished. Nice. <laughs> Monsieur seventy eight. A reflection nebula located in the constellation of Orion, here visible in the lower right corner of the image. It's about 1,600 light years away from us, but still in our galaxy. Also visible on the image is the red nebula, which is a part of Barnard's loop. It's an emission nebula, so a ionized hydrogen, a so-called hydrogen alpha region, which emits this red light. Also, the open star cluster on the lower left corner of the image is visible. It's a enrichment of stars. That's gorgeous, man. I want to go. <laughs> wow. It's a beautiful thought, Marco. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a stunning video, and the the technology that's uh, that regular people can buy is amazing. Yeah. Uh, it and and the dedication you have to have, though. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It's <clears throat> the yeah. astrophotography people at any star party. The astrophotography people are all off by themselves in the corner, worrying about stray light. And uh, yeah, they're <laughs> they're the hardcore, uh, hardcore nerdy types. Yeah, I actually done some astrophotography like thirty years ago. Um, my dad had gotten a, a Celestron C8, and we did it tried it in the backyard, but between like so much light pollution even like looking straight up ahead um it was it, and it was tough i mean because 
you know, you're the one, I was the one that was guiding the scope. And it's like, <laughs> I, I could, I mean, forget it. I wouldn't even think about a five minute exposure. It's like 30 seconds was like a long exposure and, and taking film, regular film. I mean, the, the film speed that you had, the fastest at the time was 3200 ASA. Um, and then you would, they would take that, expose it to chemicals to expand it so you could get it even longer. But I mean, you're still talking like, you know, to get an image that wasn't going to start getting clouded by light pollution, you know, in maybe 30 seconds or something. And then you didn't, you couldn't stack them like you do now too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and the dirty little secret too, is that, uh, uh, you know, the exposure time is longer here, but, but three hours of processing the, the yeah. video or digital image afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I I know all about post production. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but that that the, just the dedication to you know to invest in a machine like that to learn uh, how to use it effectively to be out there in the cold. I mean, it, you're not at your schedule. You're at the night schedule when it says it's clear out, and it it doesn't matter, man. You're out there, so. Uh, <laughs> For, for Marco to show us a little bit of the behind the, the scenes was really interesting. I'm, I'm glad you did that. Thank you, buddy. I'm glad we didn't have to compete with oriented uh, Marco today. <laughs> <laughs> um, he showed us some beautiful uh, things, uh, places that are in our galaxy. But uh, every week we take a tour uh, stop uh, as of last week, we started uh, a, a stop uh, on our tour of the solar system. So this week, we uh, we are stopping at a at a planet in our solar system, and I'm going to kick it over to Mike Kelly, who so graciously volunteered to take us on our tour. Up, oh, hold on one second. Let me just pause this. I, actually, I can share that. Two. All right. There you go, Mike. It's all yours, my man. Okay, so every good presentation needs a icebreaker. Uh, so you can see on your screen there, there is Jupiter, where we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and how do you, uh, what do you say when you get to Jupiter? I.O. Jupiter. <laughs> I got I.O. right down at the bottom of the picture there. Nice. Uh, so, Topher, you want to pop to the next slide? We'll get right into it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I had my uh, my fair share of, uh, of Jupiter when I was going through uh, grade school. So uh, just a, a quick uh, history of Jupiter. So Jupiter, it's really hard to kind of say, hey, when was it discovered? Because it is one of the brightest objects you can see in the night sky. So um, our ancestors have been looking up at the sky for forever and have been seeing Jupiter up there. So it doesn't really have a known first find date, right? Um, Moving on down, though, this guy up here in the upper left corner, Galileo Galilei, made a kind of a big splash in the world when on January 7th, uh, 1610, uh, he pointed his kind of rudimentary telescope, which was not quite as nice as what Mirko just showed us, <laughs> up at the sky and looked at Jupiter. And he noticed four little things going around there, which fundamentally changed our understanding of the solar system. So those four little things, which he initially described as stars, that were following Jupiter over the next couple of weeks, he kind of went and noticed, hey, they're not just following Jupiter, they're going around Jupiter. They're orbiting Jupiter, um, which kind of put a, uh, a bee in the bonnet of the Ptolemaic thinking at the time that our little rock, the Earth, was the center of the universe and everything else rotated around it. Well, here goes Jupiter and it's got its own things rotating around it. Mm -hmm. uh, and he came to the conclusion that those are moons. Uh, and that was the end of uh, kind of well, the beginning of the end of Ptolemaic thinking as far as the Earth being centroid. Um, moving on down the line, uh, we talked about a little bit about the speed of light and how long it was going to take the signal that the, uh, the rover had successfully landed on Mars to get back to Earth, which was about seven minutes, I believe what was discussed. Mm -hmm. Well, you can thank the understanding of the knowledge of the speed of light to Jupiter or more specifically to Io. Um, so back in the day, and it was August 22nd of 1676. So we're talking a long time ago. There was a Danish astronomer named Olaf Rammer. Hopefully I'm pronouncing his last name right. 
and he had an epiphany. He liked looking at uh, looking at Jupiter and watching the the moons orbit around it. And he took some of that orbital data of Io moving around Jupiter, and he realized that based on different times of the year and different positions of Io and Jupiter, that the there was a 17 minute difference between the the images he was getting in its position. Well, Io orbits around Jupiter in a fixed speed. Jupiter orbits around the sun in a fixed speed, and so does the Earth. So what can account for that difference? And the only thing he could come up with and, and had an epiphany and figured it out was it was the amount of time it took the light to travel from Io through his telescope to his eye. And he did crunch the numbers, did the calculations, and back then he calculated with a pretty high accuracy what the speed of light was. So wow. you can thank Jupiter for the speed of light. That's interesting, dude. Um, down at the bottom left of the uh, the, the slide, I got the, uh, the great red spot. Everyone's familiar with the great red spot. Um, hmm. that, that great red spot uh, was described in 1831 by Samuel Schwaber. Uh, so that's kind of his mark on Jupiter. And he wasn't the first to see the great red spot. Um, that was actually originally described in 1665 by an Italian astronomer, uh, Giovanni Cassini. It's a pretty famous name in, yeah. in the world of astronomy, right? Mm -hmm. Cassini probe, right? Um, but he was the first to describe it and uh, and uh, explain its its redness. So he he uh, brought a lot of attention to the Great Red Spot, um, which isn't always red. It actually fluctuates in color. Uh, and it also fluctuates in size, and it's been on a downward trend. It's over 300 years old, um, and it's on a downward size trend. So they're thinking that one day that that great yeah. red spot will eventually disappear. Uh, but don't be sad, because it should be replaced by some other giant red spot. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> um, so keeping keep it along the history chain on Jupiter, in 1955, two scientists right out, outside of D.C. went ahead and... Uh, we're taking radio signal uh, recordings from um, different astronomical objects in the sky, uh, and they noticed a trend in their couple weeks long amount of data that every night uh, they got a certain blip uh, of a radio signal that, that came at the same time every night, and they were wondering what it was. So they went back and reprocessed their data and figured out where they were pointing their, uh, their uh, radio array at that each time of that night, uh, and it turned out to be Jupiter. And they used some of that uh, pulse data for the signal they got to figure out exactly how quick Jupiter was rotating. Uh, and that helps dial in how long a day is on Jupiter, which happens to be just around 10 hours, Damn. which we'll, we'll see in the, the facts here in an upcoming slide. Um, then uh, July 5th, 1977, uh, we sent the first two probes to head around uh, Jupiter. And that helped us uh, to establish the fact that Jupiter indeed does have a little ring system. Um, so when looking back at the uh, back at Jupiter with it backlit by the sun, they were able to see the faint rings uh, of Jupiter. And they've uh, since determined that those rings, unlike the rings of Saturn, which are made out of ice, are actually uh, microscopic dusty rock particles. Uh, and all you meteorite lovers out there, which should be everybody, uh, the theory is that those rings of Jupiter are created by meteoritic impacts on the inner moon system of Jupiter. And that's the dust trail left behind that gets caught in orbit and kind of follows the moons. So those moon, uh, moons and the uh, rings are closely aligned where they have a similar orbit. That's cool. um, and then finally, December uh, 7th, 1995, uh, since Galileo just couldn't rest, uh, we went back to Jupiter and Galileo got some more play in the form of a uh, probe that went around and that probe became the first ever to take up orbit around Jupiter uh, and while around there it observed um, that Jupiter's moons of Europa, Ganymede and Callisto have uh, salt water underneath their surfaces. Uh, it also observed um, volcanic activity on the moon Io uh, which turns out to be the most volcanically active object in our solar system. Am I popping the next slide? So there's a close-up of Io, uh, and that uh, plume you see coming from the top up there uh, is actually 
uh, the largest volcano on Io, uh, which is the most active in the uh, in the solar system, going off. Wild. Next slide. So Jupiter by the numbers. Uh, so Jupiter is obviously uh, very, 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 very large, 88,736 miles in diameter, um, which makes it the largest planet in our solar system. Um, it has a mass that is 318 Earths, uh, which is interesting because the volumetric size is not 318 yeah. Earths multiplied to. So you're looking at an incredibly dense uh, planet. Uh, and they've actually done some interesting calculations that if it were to grow in mass even by six times its, its current mass, it would actually shrink uh, because the compaction it would create just a higher density mass uh, and it wouldn't grow in any size. It would get smaller. Um, we talked about the rotation a little bit. It was figured out in 1955. Uh, so it is the fastest rotating planet uh, with a daily periodic axle rotation of just 9.8 hours. Um, and it takes 12 years to go around the sun. So it is, uh, it's moving out there. It's like 5.1 to 5.2 AU units, which is the distance between the sun and the earth. Um, other interesting things, that, in, that very large mass uh, creates a very strong field of pulling in magnetic uh, and other charged particles. So the magnetic field, the magnetosphere around Jupiter, uh, which isn't really a sphere. It's kind of like this big comet-shaped uh, field around there. So it's got a trailing tail that, that chases the planet around. It's 14 times stronger than the Earth's uh, magnetic field, uh, which causes greater aurora borealis effects up at the poles, uh, but is also devastatingly brutal to any orbiting satellites in the inner moons. Um, so putting a satellite, uh, you know, putting a, a uh, artificial satellite around there, a probe and orbiter uh, around Jupiter is incredibly challenging because uh, the harshness that a magnetic environment is experiencing. Um, we mentioned that it was seen in really, really early times. So it is our fourth brightest object um, in the night sky behind the sun, the moon, and Venus. Um, that great red spot we talked about, you could fit uh, three Earths approximately inside of there, 24,860 kilometers uh, across. Uh, and unlike our last uh, visited uh, location, which was incredibly warm based on its location to the sun, uh, bring your coat because uh, well, at least the front side of, of Kepler B was, was warm. Uh, Jupiter's average temperature is around 150 degrees in the negative Celsius. So it's, uh, it's a little bit cold. <laughs> Um, it does have 79 known satellites, so there are a lot of moons and other things orbiting Jupiter. Um, it is not, however, the uh, uh, solar system object with the most moons. Um, I believe it comes in number two. Um, and we have visited nine times so far, um, and all of those visits have been by NASA. Uh, so I, I won't read them all out, but uh, here are here's a list of those those nine visits, uh, and there are some future ones planned. So it is it is a well visited uh, planet. It is hard to get there. It takes a long time. A lot of those were flybys. So things like the Voyagers uh, just took took some images as they uh, were headed towards and out of our our solar system. But uh, we we learn a lot by going there. And we're the Next only one. ones that go, huh? <laughs> Yep. So here's one of those back looking images. Uh, so the sun is behind the planet and, and you get this uh, visibility of the, the rings, which are uh, described as very dark, very fine particulate material, uh, not really icy at all. Hmm. Next slide. Um, so fun facts, Jupiter was named after the king of the Roman gods, Jupiter. That makes it really easy to remember. Um, it's four largest moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Calypso. Uh, of those, Ganymede is the largest, and it's actually the largest moon in the entire solar system. Uh, and interesting enough, it is larger than the planet Mercury. That's crazy. So it, it's, it's the moon of Jupiter is bigger than some of the other planets, in, oh, one of the other planets in the solar system. Um, we already went over it is It is our largest planet. Um, and like we said, although it is... 318 times the um, mass, it is only 11 times the size. 
Um, its composition is mostly hydrogen and helium, uh, and it in fact has the largest ocean in the solar system. Uh, don't bring your swimsuit. It's not water. It is liquid hydrogen, so wow. no swimming. Um, and it is believed to have a core that consists of ice, rock, and, and uh, a metallic inside. I wanted to know that question for years. Yeah, there there is something in there. You would never reach it to stand on the surface because the pressure in, gets so intense that it would crush anything going in there. And in fact, that intense pressure was used because when they found the salt water on the moons, they were nervous about contamination, which they talked about on the Mars probe with carbon. Um, so the orbital probes, the ones that actually went and didn't pass by and stayed around and checked out the moons, were actually intentionally crashed into Jupiter as their final act mm -hmm. in order to destroy them to prevent any possibility of, of contamination uh, <clears throat> to any of those moons since they could potentially harbor life. That's wild. Um, so those, those cloud bands are kind of distinctly Jupiter, um, and they are mostly made of ammonia and sulfur. And the surprising thing is for as big as Jupiter is, uh, that cloud layer is actually only 71 kilometers thick. Everything else below there is kind of the helium and the hydrogen. Um, hmm. So the, the clouds that we see and, and associate with Jupiter's banding and those great storms are not, uh, they're a very thin top layer. Um, and then finally, uh, that magnetosphere, uh, as we mentioned, is really, really crazy strong and creates uh, probably the best aurora borealis in the uh, solar system. So next slide. There you have a picture of the Aurora Borealis in the upper right-hand side. That was a Hubble shot. Uh, and the lower left-hand side uh, is some of the interesting cloud formations that swirl around the poles uh, that NASA took and turned into 3D images or 3D modeling based off of the images. So it's kind of got a series of storms that are continuously orbiting the poles uh, in trapped bands. I I've wanted to see the Aurora Borealis on our planet uh, before I die. And well, at least I can say I've seen it on Jupiter now. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's actually interesting. Different planets have different colored Aurora Borealis, I guess, based on the, uh, the strength of the magnetic field and, and particles that they're, they're getting uh, impacted by. Uh, so uh, like we said, uh, hopefully you all like meteorites. Uh, so you can thank Jupiter for all, well, not all of them, but a lot of the meteorites we have. Um, so Jupiter uh, is right on the outside of the main asteroid belt with Mars being on the inside. Uh, and during formation, you know, little bits of matter uh, accrete into planetesimals. Um, and usually those would form into protoplanets. Um, but Jupiter, being as large as it was, disrupted all the material in the main asteroid belt and prevented all that material from coming together and forming a planet. So it remained in its asteroidal form because um, as Jupiter would go by, it would impart energy on all of those uh, little planetesimals. Mm -hmm. And it imparted enough energy that instead of their uh, crashing together and sticking and accreting, they crashed together so hard that they broke up. Um, so it's, it's imparted rotational energy is what, uh, what helped keep the asteroid belt the way it is. And it still has an effect on the asteroid belt today uh, because as, as Jupiter passes by, it sets up what's called resonances. Uh, and as Jupiter comes by with its massive amount of gravity, uh, it, on these resonances, pull all the asteroids towards it, causing them to collide with each other. Uh, and destabilizing their orbit and kicking some of those bits of asteroids caused by those collisions towards the Earth, where we get meteorites. Yes, what we love, man. Next slide. So this is a diagram of uh, what I was just talking about with those resonance. You see Mars on the left and Jupiter on the right out there. Uh, and you can see the blue represents uh, the main bit of the asteroid belt. And you can see where those dips go down. And you can see up top, each of those dips where there's not a lot of density of asteroids corresponds to a resonance with Jupiter, either 1, 4, 3, 1, 5, 2, 7, 3, or 2, 1. Um, and, and those are the spots that have been cleared out. And you can see at the bottom of the diagram, they correspond uh, to the main concentrations of the different classes of asteroids uh, that you see there. Um, so I, I thought that was very neat. Uh, 
fact that Jupiter is, is part of the reason we get all the meteorites we get. Uh, and the asteroid belt is configured the way it's configured based on the gravitational influence of Jupiter. That is really, really cool. I've never yeah, seen... Yeah, that's something that uh, I've read in papers before, but didn't have a great understanding until you asked me to put this together. So I appreciate that. Yeah. So. I, you know, that that's why we're doing it, so we can learn stuff. Because someone asked me one time if a meteor was flying in outer space, could it, flo could it fly right through the, the gas uh, planet giant, uh, gas giant planet Jupiter? And I was like, I don't think so, but I don't know. <laughs> yep. Uh, so in addition to it, throwing many small rocks our way, you can thank Jupiter for being alive nowadays because it also acts to fling the larger objects out of our solar system. Uh, so it, it functions to throw off many of, of the big objects. In addition to things that are coming back into our solar system through long period orbits like comets, uh, since Jupiter has such a large gravitational field, it goes ahead and it, it catches a lot of the larger objects coming back in. So here on the left, you see uh, Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, uh, which broke up and you see the individual pieces headed towards Jupiter. Um, and no, they did not survive and go through. Uh, they impacted <laughs> and you saw a good series of brown spots that orbited the planet a couple times uh, as, as that impacted. Uh, over on the right-hand side, so if, if you do things like uh, Mirko was doing and you're, you're observing and taking uh, long time, uh, long exposure photographs or even video, uh, and if you're focused on Jupiter, you'll see every once in a while spots appear. Uh, and this happened in the last lunar eclipse too. Uh, and those spots were actually caused by uh, objects impacting at the exact time when you took that picture. Uh, so there you see a little, little impact occurring there in the top and in the bottom, you see one of those brown wow. spots left behind. Uh, that's orbiting the planet from the result of the impact. That's phenomenal. Yeah. Man. And I think Great. that might be all I had. Yeah, that was it. Hey, that was an amazing tour of Jupiter. Thank you very much. Yeah, great job. A lot of info yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely tons of information and um, just really good. In, yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan. This is, this is exactly what I had uh, envisioned this being. So thank you very much for that stop uh, on our yeah, tour no of the solar system. I'm going to pause recording in one second because I'm going to make a opportunity available for those who are on live. So got to stop the recording. Bear with me one second. Wow. And pause. Yeah, All yeah. right. So those, those people who are with us live just got in, got offered a beautiful opportunity. Ooh. But we, we were also talking while we were paused about something that's changing or something that we've, we've noticed in the NOMCOM, which, Pat, can you explain what the NOMCOM is and kind of what we noticed? Yeah, so the NOMCOM is the, the Nomenclature Committee of the Meteoritical Society, and they are a group of scientists who meet periodically to review uh, information from meteorites that are proposed for classification. And uh, the individuals involved uh, oftentimes have uh, specializations that, that result in in new things in, in the way meteorites are classified. Uh, a great example of that is uh, Dr. Grossman uh, being involved in the, the primitive type threes of introducing first the 3.1, 3.2 uh, part, but now the 3.00, 3.05, et cetera uh, part. And all all the, the deep subtyping. Yes. Uh, but the members on the nomenclature committee uh, serve a two-year term, and uh, they rotate out. And so that, that results in uh, opportunities for change or opportunities for a little different approach. And uh, uh, Mike has highlighted one of those. I'll let you describe that, Mike. Uh, so, yeah, I, I was wondering about it, and this was something that I noticed uh, twice happened last week. Um, uh, that instead of doing like a numbered pairing for new submitted material, uh, the old 
classification was updated for the new mass, which I know in the past has been something that was incredibly hard to get them to do. Uh, and it resulted in a lot of times that was uh, an extra pairing. So you'd get a new NWA number for something um, that had three or four NWAs already out there for whoever did the new submitting of the new material. Uh, but that wasn't the case uh, with the two, the two um, submissions last week. They got updated the original classification which in my mind as a collector is, is great because uh, I've accidentally, you know, purchased uh, pairings of things that I already had, you know, uh, getting excited and not going back and checking close enough what the, yeah. what the material was and if it was paired to something else. And it also even helps from a science perspective to just say, hey, this is how much of a, this is how many unique finds of that material are out there to help kind of balance how much of each, you know, um, asteroidal type, like we we're just talking about in Jupiter, we have on this planet yeah um, I, which gets I muddied when you have 12 pairings of the same material found from the same site that just shows up yeah i i'm so glad you talked about that and brought it up because um last week or two weeks last month whatever i was um marketing and selling uh some material that i got at the quartzite show it was uh paired with NWA 011, which is an ungrouped achondrite, you can't get NWA 011. So there's other meteorites that have fallen or that have been found that are identical. And when we say they're paired, that means the nomenclature committee and all the scientific uh, data has been done to show that they are chemically identical. So when they're paired means they're identical. Well, I went to, to market these things and I didn't know how to market them because they're paired to like seven different things, you know? So I could, as a dishonest dealer, say it's paired with NWA 011, total known weight 156 grams on the planet. Not mentioning the two, you know, the 800 grams it's paired to, you know? so. It, it does a disservice to the to collectors and to the media community that six people could submit hypothetically the exact same lunar at different times, and although they were identical chemically, location wise, they're going to get different numbers. And now that lunar find that was um, six kilos, it now looks like five one kilo finds. And that's not, you know, that's not what it is. You know, that's why when I, when I had my Gorora 003, I went back and got the main mass of it because I wanted that included in it. Um, one of my, uh, one of my, um, uh, classifications is a diagenite and it's a very I mean it's like a it's like a kid when, once you see your meteorite that's been classified no matter wh who shows a picture of it you're going to recognize that's my classified material well there's my exact diagenite and there is a very reputable dealer who I don't doubt is getting it classified but he's selling it as diagenite under classification. Well, it's actually paired with mine. So is a nomenclature committee going to catch that? Am I going to have to point that out to them? Are they going to then pair them? Are they going to take his NWA number away and add it to mine? I don't know. Yeah, you know, and to, to add a little complication to that too, uh, you know, they're – you're, you're speaking about meteorites that have gone through all the lab work and have been determined to be the same as something that was classified before. And generally that means they came from the same strewn field. That's it's the same uh, material from an impactor uh, just discovered by different people and, or marketed at different times. Uh, there are a lot of people who will also uh, self-pair and claim that their material is is identical to something that's in the meteoritical bulletin that practice is frowned upon uh and the 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 fact that they that in the past they've not updated total known weight of uh various finds 
um, even makes it a little bit more cloudy, but uh, legitimate dealers uh, here in the U.S. are rigorous about how they speak about uh, pairing, and, and Topper is one of the, the most rigorous about how speaking about that pairing. So, um, you know, if you see something on Facebook uh, that says paired with XYZ, if that's all that's said and there's no lab work that's done, that can just be somebody who says, well, my rock looks like something that's classified. So uh, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Exactly. Thank you for the shout out. I appreciate it because I, I do want to be as ethical as possible. And on top of that, I don't want anyone to have anything in their collection that they're super proud of. That's not what they think it is. I mean, that's that's got to be a shitty feeling, you know what I mean, when it's discovered. So, yeah, um, they're pairing. I'd like to have a, a whole hangout just on pairing. <laughs> there's there's a whole you can go really deep into it. And maybe I'm creating my own terminology here, but I have a term called field paired. When something is field paired, it means that to me, this is my terminology, that a trusted source near the source can vouch for it. Meaning this guy knows who he got it from, and he knows where it came from and it can validate that it was from the location and that it matches other material taken from there as well. So that's field pairing. The next step up would be kind of like um, you send it to a lab and they say, yes, this is definitely um, a carbonaceous meteorite or yes, this is definitely um, Martian, but they're not going to give you the classification of shergatite, chassignite, uh, or lunar feldpatch breccia. They're just going to tell you, yes, this is extraterrestrial material, and that could be used for um, preliminary pairing. So you can say, you know, based off of this, it is taken from the same strewn field from a reputable buyer through a reputable dealer went to a reputable lab and it tests as the initial test as Mars. So yes, we can now say it's potentially or probably paired. The next step up would be paired. And that word is used and abused. Um, just because I say it's paired, well, you know, these pills and these pills, eh, I'll just pair these and send them to your grandmother doesn't work that way. You, you know, it, it, you can't sell something advertised as something when it's not, especially when someone has already spent money, time, and effort sending stuff to a lab, making a donation to the lab to get that classification. They own that classification, and now you're piggybacking on their, their you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi wouldn't let you do it. You know what I mean? So just word to the wise, like like Pat said, you know, be careful, you know, when, when someone says it's paired or it is something, they should be able to prove it. But, I mean, flat out, they should be able to give you some documentation, some provenance line, some purchase line where they can make you comfortable that you're not getting ripped off because you don't have a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. You don't have a back scanning electron microscope. You don't have a micro probe, you know? So you're basically taking that seller's word for it. And that seller may be motivated by money, not by science. So, well, well, Topher, be careful. I mean, you have Donald Held on here and he has a sem now. Yeah, <laughs> he has some news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Most humans on the planet don't have the type of, of access that that this group has, you know, and, and I'm not like I said, it's not egos at all. We just have a very eclectic but similar group of people here. And some people have built their careers or their jobs around it or or maybe they work with uh, electron scanning microscopes inside. Of, hey, what the heck? Let me look at a mic. Let me look at a meteorite under this thing. 
So, yeah, uh, we are running super long today, yeah. but I think we we really had a good. Um, I think we really had a good uh, hangout. Hopefully, everyone can see each other now. Can we? Nice. All right. Yeah, we had a bunch more people earlier. People were coming in, dropping out. That's what happens when you have a two and a half hour hangout. But um, everyone, thanks a lot for for hanging in as long as you did. I'm actually thinking about getting all the regulars um, knowledge bolide team member shirts. <laughs> so we'll have to talk about that offline, guys. Nice, Cameron. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for everyone helping out. If you showed something off, please send me a message. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Wave goodbye, boys. <laughs> Good job, Tucker. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, safe guys. landings, perseverance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Safe landings tomorrow, guys. Um, uh, follow me on Facebook and we'll do a, a live watch. Oh, nice. All right. Take care, guys.